now I'll introduce the woman who will introduce the director. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl Orr has more than 25 years of experience in public administration. She's the director of human resources for Prince William County, one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. She also teaches a very popular human resources and personnel management course here at the Center for Public Administration Policy, Cheryl Orr. It's uh, my honor to introduce, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, Mr. John Barry. He is the federal government's chief people person. As the director of the United States Office of Personnel Management, he's responsible for recruiting and hiring and setting benefit policies for 1.9 million federal civil ser employees. Calling this a new day for the civil service, he is reinvigorating the federal workforce to meet the challenges of the 21st century. His goal, to build a workforce of dynamic innovators who put serving the American people at the heart of everything they do. With over 20 years, by the way, did you say 20? Mine is about 22. <laughs> With over 20 years of experience in the federal government, John has first developed his expertise in federal employee and retirement issues during, um, excuse me, retirement issues during 10 years as the legislative director for Congressman Stinney Hoyer of Maryland, now the House Democratic Whip. During the Clinton administration, he also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary for Law Enforcement at the Department of the Treasury, where he had direct line authority over 40% of the federal law enforcement community, including the Secret Service and the ATF. He then served as the Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget at the Department of the Interior. Um, I have, I, as everybody knows, I've been so excited to introduce Mr. Barry. But I want to read, I belong to an organization called the International Public Management Association for Human Resources. And we had our conference about two weeks ago in Nashville, and I'd like to read something. It's called the Warner W. Stockberger Achievement Award. The Warner W. Stockberger Achievement Award is presented annually to recognize a person in public or private life regardless of their affiliation with the organization, who has made outstanding contributions in the field of public sector HR management at the federal, state, or local level. This year, IPMA HR is proud to pre present this year's Warner W. Stockberger Achievement Award to Mr. John Barry, Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Now, when I was in uh, Nashville, I got to see him on a videotape. Here, I can just see him. <laughs> so, welcome and thank you. Sure. <laughs> Well, it is so kind to be with you, and Cheryl, thank you. My gosh, what a great introduction. I uh, appreciate it very much, and uh, it is such an honor for me to be with such a great institution uh, that you all are now part of. Uh, and uh, as you, many of you are either changing careers or thinking of new careers or launching your own career, um, it is a real treat to get to talk with you and hopefully uh, uh, maybe plant a few seeds where you might be interested in our uh, public service. But I also thought, in sort of, you know, I'm going to, you know, maybe exercise your speaker's prerogative, if you will, and rather than give you the prepared remarks of the 21st century, because you can read that in Fed Times and, uh, you know, what we're working on, uh, I don't need to go through the litany of, of those things. But I think when I think of, uh, when I was reading about your program, and that you are embarking and, and studying and learning and entering the field of public administration and public policy. Um, it struck me as uh, you might uh, be better served by my sharing uh, some of my secrets uh, that I have learned over the course of my career in the federal government in terms of what helps you to be successful in public policy. And so with your indulgence, I will do that. And then maybe, you know, doing Q, because we'll do Q&A afterwards. Um, you know, we can get into any specifics or, you know, if you guys want, if there are specific questions we can get to, we can get to those. 
But uh, is that okay? Uh, is, or, okay, good. All right. Well, I, uh, uh, let me let me start off. I'm going to hit on three key things that I think are important uh, for you to try to remember. Wherever your career takes you, these will hopefully be helpful. The first, and I would argue it's the most important, is maintain your integrity. If you've ever sat in the bathtub and tried to hold water in your hands, you know how hard it is. Think of your integrity as that water in your hands. Now the good news is, even though everything in the world, gravity, your colleagues, politics, whatever, is going to try to take it out of your hands, whether you end up your career holding as much as you started with is entirely up to only one person, you. My advice to you is if somebody asks you in your career to ever even dance close to the line, let alone cross it, that you feel crosses or damages that integrity, it's your responsibility to say no. Don't expect a system to protect that. Don't expect, you, you know, you have to protect that. And it is your most precious commodity. And so I would encourage you, wherever you are in your life, to try to remember that. Now, I often try to match a story with a principle. Because when you're under the heat of fire, uh, it's oftentimes easy to forget the principle. And a story will sometimes help you to remember that. So I encourage you, when you find the core principles that you hold dear, attach a story with it, because it will help you as you go forward. And one of the stories that I have always used to remind me of the importance of integrity comes from a figure that many, I think, take for granted in our history. And oftentimes, because he is so omnipresent, people fail to appreciate the seriousness of why he is omnipresent. And that is George Washington. You know, he's got a city, he's on the dollar bill, he's everywhere. But he didn't just get there. Um, and I think the lesson that I draw from his biography, from his story, you know, all of recorded human history is not that long. 6,000 years. 6,000 years of written human history. In 6,000 years, you can count on one hand the amount of times a human being has been offered unlimited power and turned it down. 6,000 years. Now, at the end of the American Revolution, things weren't going so well. The currency wasn't worth anything. Bills weren't getting paid. Our soldiers weren't being paid. Things were not organized very well. And Washington's generals approached him and said, we can't run a country this way. He said, we have got to get better organized. We need a strong leader. We need you. Take charge. Don't let this Congress run us amok. Take charge. We will make you king. What does Washington do when offered that? In an act that's so important, it's painting hangs in the rotunda of our capital. He goes to where the Congress is meeting in Annapolis and takes off and unbuckles very symbolically his sword and goes to the president of the Congress and says, 
you gave me this to finish a job. The job is done, and I am returning the sword and the authority <coughs> to its rightful owner, and hands back that sword, and goes to Mount Vernon to take up farming. That is the level of integrity if you're going to go into public policy that Americans are going to hold you to. It is the standard against which you should measure yourself. And it is why I would argue Americans have a really good nose for BS. <laughs> because we've got this amazing example from our very founding that shows it's not about power. It's not about celebrity. It's not about whether you can dance. It's about your integrity. And when it's tested, will it stand up? Washington's was tested. And like I said, in 6,000 years, not many people have passed that test. Washington passed it. And it is why, when you think about it, Amazing. One of the things when you think of his biography, he's surrounded by some of the most incredibly amazing smart people in our entire country's history. Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Adams. They're at each other's throats. They're fighting. There were core disagreements right from the beginning. This was not a country that was built on solid agreements. It was built on disagreements right from the get-go. But at the end of the day, when they were all fighting in a room, and George Washington would say, guys, I think this is the way we should go. Four, all four of these brilliant minds go, okay. They didn't respond to him because he was the tallest, or because he was the biggest, or because he was the smartest, because he wasn't. He'd admit, I'm not smarter than these four guys. What they responded to was his integrity. And that's why I say it is the most precious thing you hold. And so hang on to it. And if you have it, people will follow you through fire. They will lay down their lives if you can maintain it. And so that's lesson one. Lesson two. And this is one more aimed at your generation uh, because you are more susceptible to some of these foibles. Now, all of us are, um, of being distracted. And one of the most important things you're going to do as a leader is to be present. And when I say be present, I mean you are creating an environment where you are willing to listen and that you are willing to accept criticism and that you want to know when things are going wrong. There are a lot of people who spend their time sending every signal that that's not what they want. Think about it. You think of, a, of the worst manager you've encountered. You all have probably worked for them. <laughs> Did they talk to you on the elevator? Probably not. They were probably on their Blackberry because they were very importantly emailing the president. Or thinking they were. <laughs> Did they talk to you in the line at the cafeteria? Probably not. Did they ask for your opinion? Did they solicit openness? Did they, when someone raised a problem, were they like, I don't want to hear about that. Did they cut it off or did they encourage? Think about every signal you send. And you send those signals as to whether you're present. Trust me. The people who are standing behind you in the cafeteria line know if you are not looking around. And know if you're not saying hello in the hallway. I mean, one of the most important things I did when I got to OPM was I started saying hello to people. 
It was sad, and I don't know why, but I'll tell you what, when the first day when I walked in, I, you know, I'd run the National Zoo. That was the job I'd come from. My dream job. Pretty fun job, all right? They named a lion for me when I left the zoo. <laughs> You know, who's going to mess with me on Capitol Hill? I will go and get my line. <laughs> um, you know, so I came from a pretty fun environment. I didn't have to wear a tie to work. You know, you're a zoo director. No one expects it. I walk into this building. I'm walking down the hall. I'm saying, hello. Everybody's looking down. And I'm like, you know, it took a couple of days before people actually looked up and responded. I was like, what is going on? And when I did, when they said, and I said, hello, and I'm like, no. I was like, did the last people beat you? What? I mean, <laughs> this is not how you should respond, you know? These people interpret signals. And they interpret those signals that you are sending when you don't think you're sending them. In the elevator, in the garage, in the cafeteria. Now, let me just give you a story that exemplifies how critically important it is that you're sending the right signals versus the wrong signals. Horatio Nelson. I love him because his entire management philosophy boiled down into three words. He didn't get caught up in a lot of deep strategy. When people said, like, you know, what's your strategy? His, he would tell his captains, <laughs> have at it. <laughs> pretty simple, pretty direct. But what he also did was he ate with his captains, even once he became an admiral. And he invited them. And over those dinners, he wouldn't just ask what was right. He'd ask, what did we do wrong? And he would learn things. And people would know he wants to hear this. He wants ideas. Now, Napoleon had invaded Africa. And he had left the entire French fleet to guard his rear in Alexandria. And Nelson is searching, trying to find the French fleet, and comes upon them in a place called Aboukir Bay. Now, in a classic strategy, Nelson, this is not like one where he says, okay, let's all get together and think what we're doing. He's like, let's go, we found them, have at them, clear for action, boom, they're going in. Now, you got to put yourself back in the British Navy of these days. When you say clear for action, it's not like this was a calm incident. They are knocking down walls. They are rolling out cannons. Things are happening. Everybody is running, loading, moving, uh, bringing gunpowder up from the bottom of the boat. Everything is chaos. Now, amidst this, while they're sailing in, Nelson's crew is looking at the numbers of the French fleet, which are like two to one against the British. And they're looking at the French flagship, which has two more decks of cannons than Nelson's flagship, and thinking, oh, you know, you got to be thinking what's going through their heads is these don't look like good odds, all right? Nelson is sailing into action. When a young sailor gets an idea and goes to his captain and says, Captain, I noticed something that I think is important. The captain immediately grasps it and signals Nelson through this chaos, look at the anchor chains. Now what had happened was the French ships had all anchored so close into the shore that no one thought there was any room to go between the shore and those ships. But what Nelson's sailors noticed was because of the tide, there may just be enough water between the shore and those ships. And so Nelson gets this signal through this chaos, gets immediately what the sailor is trying to tell, and does what could be one of the, it was a brash decision, and people in the military and the Navy tell me that this could have gone down as one of the biggest mistakes of all time, because he splits his fleet. He says, Half go left, half go right. And Nelson leads the right, knowing it's dangerous. And if there wasn't enough water, they all would have run aground, would have lost the day. It would have been one of the biggest disasters in naval history for the British. What does Nelson find? Not only is there enough water, 
the French hadn't even opened their gun ports on the shore side or loaded their guns. And when Nelson's barrage hits the French flagship, it causes what is the largest made human noise in that 6,000 years we're talking about. Up until that point, this big a sound had never happened because the entire French flagship blew up. It was heard five miles away. Napoleon has to walk home <laughs> and abandon dreams of empire in Africa. And his walk home ends ultimately in his isolation at Elba. Why? One would argue Nelson did not start to create the environment of I am willing to hear from anybody who has a good idea if he waited to ask for that when he needed it when he was sailing in Abukir Bay it would have been way too late he created the environment long before can you imagine the guts it would take for a private amidst that kind of chaos to go to their captain and say, you need to signal, not just, you know, you need to go to the top, to Nelson on his admiral flagship and tell him this. You know, that doesn't happen in normal military order. I'll just give you a funny example of how it happened. Well, a little tiny one. I'm the guy who makes the snow call in DC, whether, you know, the government. <laughs> why most of you probably hate me at some point, you know, I understand. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, trust me, you never make everybody happy. But anyways, one morning, I'm getting out of bed, we make these calls at 2.30, between 2.30 and 3.30 in the morning, all right, so you have to get out and make these calls, because my promise is to get the word out by four. So we made a call that morning, and, and uh, so, and, most times you can't get back to bed because you're wide awake, you know, so you just go to work. But that day, I felt, okay, I'm tired enough, I went back to bed. I get up at 6.30 and I get this phone call, the phone call rings and gets me up at 6.30 and I say, yeah, and he says, Mr. Bray, you don't know me. I'm one of your employees, I'm driving into work now, I'm listening to WTOP, and they are saying that they're trying to get OPM on the phone and no one will answer the call, OPM is in bed. And I'm like, what? You're, oh my God, quick, call WTOP. Like, this is John Berry. Like, I hear you're looking for someone at OPM. I'm, 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 I can help. I'm, they say, oh, Mr. Berry, hold on. We're going to put you on the air live. I'm like, I'm in my boxer shorts. So I'm like, this is, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know. We got the word out, we answered the question, we, we answered the thing, and the fire was put out. Can you imagine what would have happened if for another, every 50, you know, because TOP repeats every 10 minutes, you know, OPM is still in bed. <laughs> My head would have been on a pike outside of the White House by 10, you know. I was saved by this guy. He had the guts and he knew, like, I got to call, he just, he, you know, called my house and got me. Well, I get to work and I see him and I, I said, you know, God, thank you, you really, you saved the whole agency. But he was looking like, like what's, what's the matter? He says, well, he says, gosh, you know, Mr. Burton got to work and, oh, geez, and my, told my manager what I'd done. And he's like, oh, no, you shouldn't have done that. You should have called, you know, so-and-so with communication. And so on, yeah. Which would have been, what, another two hours of OPM is still in bed. Well, just by luck, we had all of our managers together that morning. I hadn't planned it was for another thing. But I began that management meeting by having this gentleman up and saying, telling this story and saying, this guy saved our butts. And, oh, by the way, I'm giving him a check. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, you, the manager of this guy, come up and help me present this check because you understand just how important this is. Sending those signals. But think about it. You know, it goes back, it goes back to what I said, like think about 
wherever, <laughs> whenever you are, you're creating a climate. You want the climate that Nelson had at Abu Kir Bay. I cannot tell you how many times my people have pulled my butt out of a fire long before the fire consumed anything and we got the problem solved because people knew this is a guy who wants to know the problems, not hide the problems. Create that climate. Be a listening boss. Show people you want to listen. Don't get sucked into your Blackberry or your smartphone or whatever you use. It does eat your life and your brain. You've got to break it, you know? It's an addiction. And as a manager, it's a good tool. But be careful because if you allow it, if, you're, if, if your whole life is this, people are going to say, you don't want to hear from me. She doesn't want to know what I think. So be careful. The third thing, and uh, my final story, and it's probably the secret, I think, of my success. And I'm going to pass it to you and save you a lot of money on management books. <laughs> a fortune at airports. Um, and it is a secret that you really need to understand well if you're going to succeed in Washington, especially. This town is not set up to get things done. That is not something that I'm inventing. That's what the Founding Fathers wanted. There is a reason over 3,000 bills are introduced into the Congress every two-year cycle and less than 300 of them ever make it to law. That's what they want. They didn't want 3,000 easily enacted. <coughs> the entire system is set up to stop things. It is much easier to kill things in this town than it is to get them done. The entire, as I started, as she mentioned, on Capitol Hill. I was 25 years old working for Stanley Hoyer at the time. And one of the scariest things you learn when you're working in the Capitol <coughs> is how the actual building itself, the architecture, recreates the labyrinth that the Constitution creates. There are a whole alley with hallways. They go nowhere. And they dead end. And at the end of them, you will find a skeleton with an intern back. <laughs> there are countless, you know, they go no, there are rooms that's like they follow one another. Wait a minute, this, what is this room? You know, and it's, it doesn't make sense. But that's how it is supposed to work. And it is the theory that We've got to be careful before we let things happen. We need to make sure we are thinking them through well. And that in a country as big and diverse as ours, you need to give time for everybody to be part of that decision as we come forward. And that's why it's so hard. But it is also why you need this secret. The only way you will succeed through this process is persistence. Lincoln will tell you it is the thing he most prized in all of his generals. And he said, give me persistence over luck, over skill, over smarts, over anything. Persistence. And it's why he was so excited when he found Grant. It's why when Grant, after his first loss to Lee, when he got up after being put in charge of the whole army, for the first time, the army didn't just go away and lick its wounds. He re-engaged the next day. And the soldiers were like, this is different. And he didn't let go of Lee until he forced him to surrender at Appomattox. He walked through swamps in July and August. <coughs> Win or lose on that day didn't matter. He was not letting go. And he was not letting Lee out of his one arm, one day reach. Persistent. Now, I was honored at the zoo to work with a woman named Dr. Deborah Kleinman. And the story that I always remind myself of just how important, what 
miracles you can accomplish if you are persistent. She embodies this better than anybody I could ever tell. She was the first woman to actually, she crafted the term conservation biologist. Didn't exist before. And zoos up until this time were mostly menageries. They were places people went and took their kids to saw animals. Deborah was a scientist and said, you know, we've got to be involved. These animals are going extinct. We've got to do something about it. We should need to be involved. And she decided yet she took one animal and said, we're going to make a difference on this one animal. And she started with a little thing called a golden lion tamarind. And it is a bright orange monkey. And then melt your heart. It's really cute. You know, they're, they were in zoos all over the country. But in the wild in Brazil, where they were native, they were crashing. Their numbers were below 200, and they were almost extinct. And Deborah says, we're going to do something radical. We're going to take monkeys away from zoos. We're going to put them together. We're going to breed them. We're going to be careful with the genetics. We're going to do this right. And then we're going to take those monkeys down to Brazil and let them go and see if we can repopulate the population down in Brazil. Well, you can imagine this was... People didn't give up their monkeys easily. Deborah was tough. She fought it, took them, got them, bred them, developed a population, took them all down to Brazil. They all died. Not one of them survived. Now, a lot of people would give up at that point. It was pretty embarrassing. She took a lot of hard knocks in the press. She took a lot of hard knocks from her colleagues. This was the first time anybody tried to do this. See, we told you it wasn't going to work. You've heard this. Does Deborah go away? Instead, Deborah ignores all that clutter and says, okay, the monkeys died. How do you teach a monkey how to live in the wild? She goes to the director of the zoo at the time and says, we're going to try this again, although this time we're going to let the monkeys go in Rock Creek Park. Mike Robinson, who's then the director of the zoo, is like, what? Really? <laughs> how are you going to find them? This is before radio collars. This is before... You know, all of that stuff we got today, you know, where you can track everything on the planet, you know. None of that existed. Deborah's answer to Mike's, Mike, they're orange. Good burgers can follow them, you know, we'll find them. She did this. She let them go. And they had to get, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Rock Creek is a migratory raptor <coughs> pathway. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a major flyway for raptors, hawks and eagles. And, and, and owls go this route, migrating during the year, and they eat while they're going. <laughs> and so everything in Rock Creek Park is like trying to hide from something trying to eat it. Well, those monkeys were in that category. They had to learn how to get away from raptors that were trying to eat them. And they had to learn how to get inside during the storm, and they'd get their own food. Well, she did this enough, with enough, that she took them down to Brazil. And not only did they survive, but they bred like rats. <laughs> and today there's over 3,000 of them in the wild. Now, Deborah did this with probably, I could sit here and go through another 20 species that she literally brought back from the brink through the same kind of fire in her belly persistence. But about a year and a half ago, she got cancer, and it got very serious, and she was up at the Washington Hospice Center. And we all sort of knew this was not going to end well. And so I went to visit her at the end, and I said to her, I said, Deborah, I, you know, going up, and I expected to sit down and talk and listen to her tell stories of what was a revolutionary career in terms of biology and that we would spend the day listening to her greatest and proudest accomplishments. What happened when I walked in her door? John! Oh my gosh! There is a project down in Brazil. The monkeys <laughs> will not go to the ground. They only will stay in the trees. Well, the parks they're in are connected. And so the monkeys in this park aren't meeting the monkeys in this park. John! We need to mix their genes. They've got to be structured. We've got to connect these parks with one row of trees. 
John, one row of trees is not going to cost money. What are we going to do to help raise the money to get that row of trees? This is literally, literally 12 hours before the woman died. Now, if that doesn't give you an example of persistence, maybe you should become an architect. <laughs> or something. Persistence. It will carry the day. And I will tell you, my surprise at this is this town doesn't know how to deal with it. And there used to be a line in the Greeks where they would say, you know, fortune favors the brave, or fortune favors. Uh, you know, the young, whatever. Fortune favors the persistence. Those who have. And I got to tell you, it produces miracles when you would least expect it. And somehow, when you're really serious at it, people sense it, they conspire to help you. And in oddest ways, people who you thought were your enemies sometimes become your friends because they realize, oh my God, this person is closer to actually getting this thing done than anybody's ever before. I'm going to help them just because I've never seen it get done before. Persistence. you got to have it in your But I'm talking about persistence in your gut, in your bowels. I'm not talking about on your shoulder. Last thing, and I will make you, because I'm going to be a lead into our speakers who are going to be talking about the importance of public service and how we want you to consider federal service. It is an amazing place. Forget what the public is thinking or saying or the fact that oftentimes federal servants are used as political footballs by both parties. This is not one where either party is in us. Federal employees make an amazing difference in every life of every American every day. 85% of them are outside of this city, and they are out working in every county. And without them, we wouldn't have the miracles that we have to celebrate in our generation. You can do more good, and on a scale that is second to none, pick any company, no matter how large, it is not touching as many lives as you can touch for the better in public service. And so I hope you will think about federal service when you're thinking of a career, where to put your public policy or public management skills and techniques to work, because we need you. I was so honored last week to be able to be at the National Cathedral to represent, not there myself, but there as a representative of the men and women of our civil service to honor someone who when he was a GS-16 was the first person of our species to set foot on another planet, the moon. And when Neil Armstrong was young, we hadn't even broken the sound barrier. Think about you know, how amazing <laughs> In his one lifetime, he went from a plane, not even able to fly faster than sound, to be walking on the moon. We are living amidst one of the greatest periods of human history. When you think the moon decoding the human genome, the creation of the internet, you know, think about it. If Gutenberg's printing press launched the age of reason, what the hell is that thing in your pocket going to launch? It is giving you access to more information than humans have ever had before. We are just figuring it out. We have almost eradicated smallpox and polio, not in the United States, on the planet. Since Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, the population of our planet has doubled. In that time, there were stories of apocalypse and fear that if that happened, everyone would starve to death. What happened? Our species came together 
and we quadrupled our food production in that same period of time. These are not like 10-year accomplishments I am talking about. The, any, pick any one of those and they will stack up in that 6,000 years of human history to Pericles, to Augustus, to Elizabeth, to whatever. They are as big and as significant when looked through the scale of history. And the best news for each one of you, it ain't over. Pericles was 15 years. Augustus, 20. It's been a lot longer since Neil walked on the moon. And it's still going. And in public service, you can keep it going. And you can continue those miracles. And you know what? Every one of those things I talked about, people may say bad things about federal employees. I would argue this. You find me the most rock-ribbed anybody, be they far left or far right. If they don't think what I just told you, those five accomplishments or six accomplishments, are, are important things, everybody thinks they're important things. Not parties. I'm talking about humans. The whole world thinks they're important things. And they have been done and led by men and women in our public service. Every one of them. Yes, with help from the private sector. Yes, with help from academia. Yes, with help from the nonprofit. But let me tell you, public servants played their critical role in each and every one of them. Each and every one. And so, ignore the daily squabbles. Ignore the press that says things are so terrible today. We are living in a golden age. And you have the privilege of continuing it. And deepening it. And broadening it. And making it far. And you now have the three secrets you need to do. <laughs> God bless you for everything you have done to get in this room today. It wasn't easy. But more importantly, my prayer is, God bless you for what you will do. Because it's what you will do that will keep our nation blessed. And thankfully, God has always done so. With that, we'll go to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll throw, you know, questions. So uh, small room, so I don't even know if I, if I guess I don't know if they're taking this for somewhere else. It looks like somebody is, so <laughs> I better stay by the mic. Um, but we'll throw it open. Anybody? Because uh, I know you, I'm also probably interrupting other things. So I don't want to stay too long in your hair. Yes? Melvin Lemire, and a first year PhD student. And I've worked with the government, including the military, for quite a number of years 30, 30 years. And uh, I, I agree with you as far as change, it takes a while. And I want to know does OPM have a relationship with colleges and universities? Um, for the purpose of research, and if you do, uh, to what degree does OPM use this research to resolve problems in government? Um, I think it's a great question, and we, it, 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 the answer is yes, and we can do a heck of a lot more. Um, we primarily rely on the unifying bodies, like Cheryl was talking about, the public administration bodies, the national uh, NASPA and ASPA, and all of the groups that bring universities and, you know, there are over 200 schools of public policy administration in the country. It's this amazing resource. But the beauty of it is that they also help us by tackling research issues and challenges. And what we will often do is longer term projects that we know, you know, can't get done in a short term nature. We go to those groups and ask if they can assemble, you know, sort of put the word out and see if there's interest in either a group of universities or a group of professors tackling an issue. And uh, we've had really good luck and good fortune with the response. I mean, the response has always been great. Uh, I think we could always do more. And there are a lot of issues that, you know, I think 
uh, you know, quite frankly, I think what constrains it oftentimes is some of the things that would benefit most by a longer, deeper study are also the things that are hot button political issues. And even the fact if I were to announce like, oh, we're going to have this study on X, body over here would rise up and scream, you know, ah, you know, you're, that, I know where that's going, you know. And so, you know, some of it is constrained by reality, but to the extent uh, it's, it's, it is a very good relationship. It is one that, you know, I think every agency needs to do because there's so many challenges that academia can help with. And quite frankly, the private sector. I'm speaking tomorrow at the Fairfax uh, Economic Development Authority and uh, about how we have taken lessons from the private sector that I've been able to bring in and drop airdrop into OPM and you know help us make become better and quite frankly I'm spinning it around and saying not only have we learned from you but there's some things we're doing that if you were to do you'd be better talking about hiring people with disabilities hiring our veterans hiring you know there are things that we are doing better than the private sector is doing and so I'm going to share with them some of the tricks that we've used that have produced you know, some of the great successes we have right now. So, we're, you know, it's a, it's a good example. It's not just universities. We need to be thinking more broadly. My view, I grew up, you know, nobody's got a lock on the truth. <laughs> and so we've got to be open-minded enough to approach it and be humble enough to work with everybody to try to find, you know, the right and best path. Okay. Anybody on this side? Yes, sir. Hi, Dr. Mary. Thank you for speaking to the wonderful discussion. Uh, I've been in and out of government and as an employee and also as a political appointee doing a lot of hiring. Uh -huh. And I wonder if I can give you a platform to speak about what you're doing with OPM to change and ensure the hiring profits, make sure we get the best and brightest to get into government. Part of that being encouraging people to apply and also addressing one of the main complaints of government employment, which is the application process. So. <laughs> Phase one, I, I look at this as phase one, phase two, and we are, we're well along in phase one, and we're about to really, I, I met with the Chico Council, we had our strategic retreat last Thursday, and, and we've designed that one of the things going forward will be phase two of this. So phase one focused on speed, simplicity, and time to hire, because we were woeful in all of those. You know, position descriptions were like 80 pages in length. I mean, not many things. The president told me, he said, he'll hold this. He, I gave him a position description of 75 pages. He said, John, my job description isn't 75 pages. <laughs> you know, you got to get rid of this crap. Yeah. So we set a goal of five pages. My real goal is two pages. But, you know, I figure going from 85 to five would be, would shake things up enough, you know, to, if you said two, people probably all would have just fell over dead. So I said, hey, you, say, you say five, and it's, oh, okay, well, maybe we should do five. You know? So anyways, we've, we've got to move into five. That's, that's coming on really well. It used to take, the average time to hire was over 140 days. Our goal is 80. We're not hitting it yet, but we're much closer to it than when we started, just by tracking it and following the data. And then the third thing, and this is the most important, you know, especially people who aren't familiar with the federal government, like roll their eyes, like really, uh, it, you know, is getting us on to the world of the resume and off of KSA Island, our knowledge, skill, and ability essay questions. <laughs> yeah. We were the only people on the planet who used KSAs. The private sector spends billions of dollars on assessment tools, all geared off of what? Resume. And so until we got onto the resume, we couldn't pretend that we were going to take advantage of all this stuff. So step one was getting on. You would not believe, but here's an example, like you know, when I talk about what you'll face and how the system is set up to stop things. It took a year and a half and a presidential executive order to go to resume. I still have my first SF-171. <laughs> <laughs> I keep going in the Office 612. So you got, so, I mean, it's not, I mean, there were lobbyists hired to defend KSAs. I mean, come on, be serious. <laughs> People made money off of this. It's like, what? It's over. So the, that was phase one. Phase two is now turning to the quality of the asset. And 
obviously we haven't been trying to, we've not been ignoring that in the first phase, but now we're looking at, okay, how can we really deepen quality? And what can we do to take advantage of now these assessment tools? Which work better? Which don't work? And so what we're asking some of our, quite frankly, deeper pocketed federal agencies to work with private sector vendors to test a number of these and, and find out, okay, does this one work better? Is this one easier to use? What, and, and because a lot of the smaller agencies now, government is on a declining budget trajectory. The next, is, regardless of what happens in November, it's going to stay declining the next five plus years. And so we've got to be smarter about how we do this. And so my theory is if we can prove it one place and then sign the right contract, everybody can benefit and then buy the, off of that one contract. And so that's the strategy we're using. Phase two is going to be focused on the, the more around the, what we can do to enhance and improve the quality of, of the applicant result. And that goes to working with managers, it goes to making sure we get mentors to people as they come in the door, it goes to, you know, I'm not just talking about simple computer things, it also goes to human resource support that can deepen that quality experience. Um, because we are getting sometimes good people and then a year they're leaving and that doesn't help anybody either. So, It'll do us no good if we got them in in 80 days, but they leave in 12 months. So we, you know, we got to we got to pay attention to all of those angles. So that's kind of where we are with hiring and, and what the strategy has been and, and where we're hoping to go. With. Okay. Yes. So um, what's the feedback based on the new process and have more applicants been applying and that sort of stuff? Definitely. Uh, you know, we are uh, USA Jobs, which uh, we brought in-house uh, and, and took some bumps for it in the first two weeks because we got swamped. <coughs> um, we are now in a place, seven, since this time last year, over 17 and a half million people have logged on successfully and filed their resume and applied for federal positions or, or done searches, et cetera. And we have hired a third party uh, contractor to test quality. And the same company that, in fact, the private sector company Monster did this before for us. Um, uh, we're using the same company that rated them. Our customer satisfaction scores are now equal to or higher than where they were before we brought it in house. And the reason I would say why, the decision why we made, there are some things the private sector can do better. But in this case, a job board is one that you want to have agility on. And you want to be able to make changes relatively quickly. And what was killing us when it was with the private sector is we want to do, okay, can we do this tweak or can we do this adjustment? Or we're hearing from people they are having this problem. Well, we can fix you that with this additional contract adjustment. <laughs> you know, so more money. And we did not have the resources, the, the, the budget is not designed to do that. And so by bringing it in-house and having all of the agencies participating in this, I don't manage USA Jobs, a group of Chicos on the Chief Human Capital Officers Council across government manage it. And they get together every two weeks and they look on the customer survey line, what problems are people having, what can we do to make it better, and then they assign and prioritize the tasking to the software teams to adjust it and upgrade it. And we are able to upgrade it now in like almost a six week turnaround period without having to do a contract and all that other kind of stuff. And so it will continue to get better because we have this feedback loop of uh, you know, improvement. And so I think it is gonna, you know, we're on the right cycle with that. Um, and. Uh, and that's that is shown, it, and it's showing up. I think you know in the customer satisfaction. I've seen the customer satisfaction go from a year ago, you know, from below fifty to now it's above. It's like above seventy-five percent. I think was the last one I saw. So it's you know I think the highest it ever reached under Monster was I think seventy-three or seventy-four. So you know we're I'm I'm feeling we're we're heading definitely in the right direction. All the you know we're. Doesn't mean it's perfect yet. Doesn't mean it won't get better. You know, we'll keep, keep getting better, but I think it's the right approach. How about one more, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, eeny, meeny, miny. Oh, all right. If we do two fast ones, and then because nobody else, okay. So you first, and then we'll do yours. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to 
Hi, Dr. Director. Uh, my name is Abraham Gunn. I'm a first year PhD student. I'm also a branch chief. Oh, at, sorry, I'm also a branch chief at FEMA. And uh, so it's kind of a two part here. One is just a, a comment. Uh, it's sort of serendipitous that you're speaking to us today because I just came back from a scheduling hiring conference that we had Great. at FEMA today. So this is just more of a, a comment so you know that the Office of the uh, Chief Human Capital and FEMA did a fantastic job, bang up job at the Central Higher Conference today. Oh, that's great to hear. Though it could have been much more shorter, organized. Yeah. No, no, much could have been much better organized. Um, the event was wonderful. Uh, I had three vacancies, and actually one that I was able to fill two day. Wow. With a Schedule A and say that. Schedule A, just for translation for everybody who might not know, in the federal government, if you are uh, severely disabled, uh, if you're a veteran who's severely disabled, you have this ability uh, where if you're qualified to do the job, you don't have to go through the competitive process and you can hire the person on the spot. And so it saves you time. I, you know what I tell people is, you know, look, we're tracking your time to hire. And if you're not at your 80 day average, if you make a couple Schedule A hires, boy, you know, zero day, <laughs> that zero brings your average way down, you know? So people are starting to learn some of the, but it's helping, really helping our disabled vets who are returning our disability community. It, it, two important statistics, because you all hear what's wrong with government. Right now, and this has happened in the past four years, we've taken veterans hiring from 24% to 28, over 28.5%. Keep in mind, I'm hiring a, for a workforce of 2 million people. So when you talk 1%, it's a big deal. You talk 4.5%, there is no historical comparison, no. Disabled vets have gone from 7% to 9% in the past three years. Right now there are 570,000 veterans working for our civilian side of the house, not Defense Department. 570,000. The highest number in, that we've ever kept records on this issue in history. Disi people with disabilities. When I got in, it was the only category that was going the, not just not, we weren't doing a good job, it was going in the wrong direction. Even after passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a, a group that makes up 54 million Americans, and a group that, mind you, every one of us in this room could join in a heartbeat. You know, you leave here and you trip wrong and you're a member of the disability community. So it is a group all of us have an interest in being helpful and supportive to, that we are not tapping into that talent. We were hiring less people with disabilities after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Horrible, shameful, period. We not only been able to get the needle going positive, last year, if you look at targeted disabilities, veterans with over 30% or greater disability, or people with any disability, 14.7% of our hires were people with disabilities last year. Again, the highest in 20 years, which is as long as we've been keeping the data on that issue. So there are things that the government can do right. And they do it quietly, and they do it every day, and it's our people who do that, it's our agencies who do that, it's people like you who go to a Schedule A conference and make a Schedule A hire. So thank you, and uh, God bless you for helping keeping those numbers going. <laughs> so that was, that was good, and then the other part was just a question. We talked about the, the reduction in the time of what it takes to bring someone on board after hiring. And that's also tied to, I believe, the quality of our hires. So it takes a long time, or it's, it's quite laborious to find that particular candidate you really want to bring on board. So because that candidate is so desirable, they're also desirable to other people in the federal government yep. that are looking for those candidates. So if your organization is lagging in hiring time, uh, more than likely, another organization that's not is going to snag that individual. And I've had it happen with me, to me on more than one occasion. And I think one of the most detrimental factors in that process is the lack of reciprocity with regard to security clearances. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that's, believe it or not, and I know that's a big problem, it, it is getting best. Um, and and not, it is something the, not, you not, haven't not, seen. Not in the Department of Homeland Security. Nor and between DHS and especially between DHS and DOD, um, it, it was it was a challenge even with me going from huh. DOD. I'm going to take that back. I'm a, I'm actually on a group that actually is involved in this that General Flapper chairs and Jeff Science at OMB and me 
and uh, Beth uh, McGrath at the Defense Department. And the four of us, it has some name, I don't know what it is, but we basically, <laughs> we, we get together and we're in charge of this issue. So I'm gonna, we're meeting on Friday and I will take that point, the, the hearing, because we, we're on, on the survey stuff, it's, we're, we're getting, now there are some lagging issues and we're still working through those. But if you have just a moment so, afterwards, I can give you a brief example that Really okay, good. Well, if I can't, if I, because I've got to get to another engagement tonight, but uh, you know, our staff will be here if you give it to them and they'll get it to me. Um, you know, two quick points though to show you how it, it, the difference can make. You know, justice, when you talk about these Schedule A hires, um, when they started out on this, we gave them a list of candidates and said, look at some of these resumes and see if anyone else. So they interviewed one guy. Well, he was a blind gentleman. But it turned out he was also a lawyer who was uh, certified to argue in front of the Supreme Court. And in fact, had done so, like not just once, but like seven times. And he had lost his job. And he wasn't getting hired because he was blind. He's <laughs> like, oh my God, this guy is like, you know, he's an amazing attorney. They hired him and they said like, <laughs> he is like leaving everybody in the dust, it, it, you know. We've got to get beyond thinking of this as a, something holding people back. You know, it enables them to be, you know, more creative and innovative and thoughtful and work around. They, you know, people with disability are used to finding their way through labyrinths. They do it every day. They've got that skill. And the other thing is, which is an interesting point, is. It also cares just about what leaders say is what can happen. <clears throat> you know what agency hired the most disabled veterans percentage-wise in the entire United States government last year? It wasn't the VA. It wasn't DOD. It was little old OPM. <laughs> I hired the highest percentage of every agency in government. And, you know, it, so leadership does matter. And people do respond, and they will help you accomplish. And that's a case where the fates have conspired to produce a great result. And guess what? Our workforce is ten times stronger because of it. It's phenomenal. So, now, real quick, and then we'll let you guys get on to the rest of your agenda. Last one. No, you. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're up. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Jonathan Che. I'm currently a civilian with the Department of the Army, and I'm also a Coast Guard veteran. Uh, just real quickly, what type of assistance are you giving to veterans besides five and ten point preference? I mean, I have to figure out at Google how to write a federal resume and copy and paste on my military emails. So, I mean, quite literally, what other types of assistance are you giving veterans besides five, ten point preference? And what partnerships and initiatives are you, uh, so you with the Department of Labor tra the uh, transition assistance yep. program? We, we have, I'll, I'll give you a bunch. First, again, it's a good example of leadership is this is one where the president issued an executive order. The first executive order he issued to that, on this issue was the federal government will become a model for hiring of veterans. Up to that point in time, the federal government did a good job of hiring veterans in DOD and in VA, but the civilian side of the house was really pretty bad. And the president said, we're going to change that. And the reason we're going to change that, he told me, was I want to help impact the unemployment rate for our men and women coming back from the Middle East. And we can only do that if the whole country gets involved. But for me to go out and preach when the federal government isn't doing its own good job, I'll get killed. And so I want you to give me a program that's going to get the civilian side up to snuff. So the first thing was the president you know, created this executive order and created a council that would follow the metrics on a very regular basis. How many disabled vets are you hiring in your applicant polls? And so, you know, following the data, how many regular vets are being hired in your poll? And, so, and we are reporting on that. And then we created a percentage hiring model that recognized agencies were different. Almost 30% of my hires are veterans. So I don't need to do much more. I just need to keep in the game and I'm doing a good job. A lot of agencies are below 5%. All right? Well, they should run a hell of a lot faster than me to catch up with what I'm doing. 
So it wasn't fair to say, okay, John, you need to do another 10% and they'll do another 10%. So rather than say we're gonna have one percentage across, we created a threefold approach where for agencies that were doing good, do better. But we're not even gonna give you a goal because you're already exceeding every goal that you know we would have set. Keep going. For the middle, run faster by a two to three percent margin. And for you folks who are down here in what's considered subpar performance, get your ass in the game, you gotta do between five and 10%. And we're gonna work with you and we're gonna send in teams. So the first was creating a model of accountability that was being tracked. And what I found after the first year, everybody sort of the first meeting, every, you know, your secretary, cabinet secretary show up, your deputy secretary, by the third or fourth meeting, I went to the president and I said, yeah, Mr. President, I was getting the A team. I'm down to the C or D team now. And I can't keep the attention and the numbers going. He says, I know to get you the A team. I said, how's that, sir? He says, well, the next meeting in the Roosevelt Room, and I'll chair. I said, ooh, I think that'll give me the A team. <laughs> and you know what? That's what happened. And we had the A team again. And that's when I talk about keeping focus, keeping cover. That was one part. Second part, right now today, in every federal agency for the first time, there is a full-time, what is called, veterans hiring officer. And that person is the connector between the EAP programs that you, when you're coming out of the military and from the VA that helps connect people with skills. And then they serve as a behind the scene. Now, you know how things get done. We've gotten them to get to know one another. So let's say the, the VSO at Commerce has this great guy who says like, oh my God, this guy's an accountant. He was doing the books in Afghanistan. You know, we sh but we don't, we just hired our account. We don't have the slot anymore. Transportation, you're looking for an account. You got to hire this guy. I'll, hey, go talk to my friend <clears throat> transportation. So we created this great network of now full-time people because before this, if agencies had them at all, they were part-time. And part-time in government is another way of saying it don't get done. So full-time means there is somebody paying attention to it. And so now you have somebody in charge of actually trying to hold hands through the process. And then we've created, working with DOD, a sort of central base of operation that is also set up for both, uh, uh, both disabled vets and veterans who can come in and get, go through training on resume, on interviewing techniques, on civilian culture. I mean, I've had three White House fellows now, all of them from the military. And the first thing they learn when they come into OPM is they, they say, oh my God, you're Mr. Baird. You know, I walk into a room, nobody stands up at OPM. <laughs> you know, you go in, if somebody walks in, you're like, I'm the equivalent of, I think, a three-star general. You know, a three-star general walks in a room, and people stand up. People don't even call me director. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's different. In the, I said, I, you know, they laugh. I, I said, like, you know, and I also point out to them, look, not one of these people is doing anything because I tell them to. They're doing it because I convince them it's the right thing to do. And that they want to have a help in sharing, you know, to help get it accomplished. It's a different mean of leadership. They're responding to me because I'm persuasive, not because of what's on my shoulder. And they got, you know, so it is a different culture. And, you know, they had to laugh. The person who came in, and, well, I'm very punctual, so I'm always, you know, on time. My dad was a Marine from Guadalcanal. He, I, we were on time. You know, 815 mass, we were there at 8. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I'm there. The first meeting, we had a staff meeting. The first guy, we were in the room. It's me and the White House fellow. No guy from the military. And the room's empty. <laughs> and I'm so I go out in the hall and I'm running out. Get your ass in here! Go on, get up here! And I have to go around people up to get the meeting started. And he's like, you know, he's like, oh my god, I can't believe this how it worked. But that's how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who cares? John Barry sitting in there at nine o'clock. You know, it's like, so what? <laughs> you know, it's a different culture. And people, you have to have something. And so one of the things we've, we're creating now is too is a mentorship program where each vet who comes in will not only have a veteran in DOD who can help them with maybe some issues of post-military issues that they might be having, but also a vet who has actually worked and lived on the civilian side of the house who says, yeah, 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 I know that's what you're hearing over there. Well, let me tell you what 
the real deal is here. And this is how you get it done here. And so that they've got a fallback network to help them succeed. And the proof is in the pudding. The numbers speak for themselves. Going to 28.7% of veterans hiring um, to the highest historical record is, is I think, great. So. All right, well, you all have been great. I'm going to let you go on. Thank you so much. Thank you.